Mm -hmm. So welcome to the last get together of uh, 2020. And it's a pleasure to introduce Georgia Scullis, who almost needs no introduction, certainly to anybody familiar with the work on ecological economics and on political ecology, where he's been a major contributor for the past many years. He is an ICREA research professor, and I thought I should mention what ICREA is for those who might not know. It's the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies in Spain. And um, he holds this professorship and has held it for the past decade now at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology, often called ICTA at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He has um, consistently focused on degrowth and is one of its main proponents and has a political economic argument um, for ways in which to move past environmental degradation and in keeping with um, limits to growth. I won't say much more about it, I won't stand between you and him, but uh, I will say that for this seminar, uh, Georges has uh, picked uh, the, the Case for Degrowth, which is a book uh, published by Wiley, where he and three other co-authors who are Susan Paulson, Giacomo Di Alisa, and uh, Federico Di Maria have put forward the case for degrowth. And, uh, and many people attending today have uh, perhaps read the chapter that concludes this book called Frequently Asked Questions, which uh, I thought was particularly nice because these are often many of the things that people come at you with whenever you mention the word degrowth. So without further ado, over to you, Georges. Yeah. Thank you, Siddharth, for the presentation. And thank you for inviting me to your seminar. I don't know if you can see, I, I put a little bit the cover of the book so that you can see it. Uh, we struggled a little bit with the cover because we didn't know how to best capture the idea of the growth. And you know, this, this type of uh, book covers, you always have a uh, back and forth uh, <laughs> with the editors and the designers that they have their own opinion. Um, we liked that it was a bicycle. Uh, I think the idea came, came, came from the editors for a bicycle. And we like that it seems to be a man, um, a man driving uh, the child uh, to school or whatever. I mean, it's a, it's a thing you see quite often nowadays, but it would be like really strange for, maybe not in Norway, but in Greece definitely would be strange for my father's generation uh, to, see if, to see a father taking a bike and getting uh, the child around or getting it to school. Um, for us, this image captured actually two arguments of the book, two, two, two basic ideas. The one is, um, uh, is a saying that Ivan Illich, a scholar that has influenced a lot of growth, he had uh, at the beginning of his book on energy and equity, and he was saying socialism will only arrive in a bicycle. It was actually the saying of a ministry from Chile. I don't remember now the name of the ministry from Chile, but I, I've, I've learned it from Ivan Illich. And I mean, you might not be in favor of socialism, but um, we might call it in, in terms of what we are discussing these days in terms of a big transformation that we all agree is necessary. And we can say metaphorically, we'll only come in a bicycle, which uh, meant will only come um, with, a, with tools that they are going to be simple, like a bicycle is a simple tool, convivial tools, let's call them, tools and technologies that we can govern and we can manage. And the bicycle, that it's a slow means of transport. Uh, it's not uh, the high-speed train. It's not like a, a, a jet fuel without um, uh, that uses, I don't know, hydrogen made by nuclear power generators, or I don't know what's the next crazy idea about how we can fly without uh, emitting carbon in how many years. Uh, but it's going to come slow. So the future, a desirable future of transformation is going to come slow, like, like a bicycle, slow and simple. And this is captured here um, in this image. The other thing that it's captured and that we emphasize a lot in the book, uh, and we consider a, a core premise of the idea of the growth, um, is care. And it's care and care that has to be universalized, care that has been uh, the unpaid and uncompensated and undervalued the role that mostly women uh, have carried up to now, but that it's now redistributed towards men. And I have to say, not it's not an only a burden, it's also a pleasure to have the opportunity, for example, I had the opportunity to take care of my twin daughters that they are nine months old this last month, and it's something I, I appreciate. 
Um, so care is also a central signifier of the growth. So along slow and simplicity, caring, and putting emphasis on, on the economies of care, which we consider is the bedrock also of the productive economy, but it's also the, it's also the part of the economy where there are injustices, uh, but there are also untapped possibilities for meaning and, and well-being to develop if this economy is organized properly. So these two things are captured by this um, by these CMADs. Now, what, what is not captured, and I think it's a little bit, it could be misleading about the content of the book. One is like, you know, the old Europe <laughs> is, an old, I don't know if you can see it, the world demons, but it's like an old European square. I don't know which city is it. It looks like a, any German or could be um, a Dutch or French city. Um, and what doesn't capture it captures the fact that public space is also something we emphasize on the growth but what what it doesn't capture first is it doesn't capture one other idea that we wanted to be captured by the image this is the emphasis we put on commoning and commons so on one on the one hand a public square is and can be a commons but the way it is depicted here of people individuals or couples going in their everyday business it's one on their own is not what we have in mind when we talk about the growth. So in the growth, we emphasize the importance of uh, reclaiming and uh, reconstituting the commons, commoning, uh, as we call it, and it's a very central idea in our book to which we develop a full chapter. So the way we think a transition akin to the growth can emerge is by starting uh, by putting more and more emphasis on commons that people are producing in their everyday, with their everyday activities. And by commons, we understand them in an extended way, not only forest and water, that is the traditional commons that environmentalists have looked upon in the school of Eleanor Ostrom, the Nobel Prize winner, but commons also in the sense of uh, cooperatives, in the sense of uh, food networks where producers and consumers come together in the form of time banks. In the, farm, in the form, if you want, of occupied squares or in the form of a public feast in the carnival or a, a public dinner that takes place out in a, in a square and people come together, organize, share resources, uh, share efforts and share pleasure. So for us, this is not captured by this image uh, because the square is a little bit empty, but that we would like ideally to capture. And finally, <clears throat> To finish talking about the image, but it's to give you a little bit of a of a feeling about the growth is in a way that it's not the formal one of following the book chapter by chapter. No, um, there is a problem of old Europe here. So it's old Europe as being like you know, for an American, this might make sense. Okay, the growth for the Americans is to to regress to some <laughs> European standard of consumption or of uh, GDP, or it might also appear attractive in the sense, you know, that for progressive Americans, uh, social democracy type of Norway is the, is the ideal, which is, which is far for, for, for their country and for their system. Uh, but on the other hand, for us, like uh, the European ideal shouldn't be romanticized that much. So Europe and the, um, and the good standard of living that we have enjoyed as uh, middle-class Europeans has to a large extent, we argue in this book, build on the back of uh, unequal exchange with the rest of the world and has like a strong uh, legacy of colonialism and a strong legacy of uh, pillaging the rest of the world for cheap resources or for shipping people uh, or for using people as cheap labor to produce the goods that we have consumed in Europe and have partly been responsible um, for the relatively good lives that the last three generations of us and comfortable lives have lived. This is not to, to underplay or uh, reject the battles that the working class have won in Europe and the welfare state and uh, the various uh, benefits that we have enjoyed and they wouldn't be, we shouldn't be taking them for granted. Uh, capital and those who have money wouldn't have given them just because there was growth or because there was uh, cheap resources coming from the rest of the world. But at the same talk, token, I think we should be aware um, that this pastoral uh, European landscape of a relaxed square um, hides a lot of injustice behind. And then the, if it is to be sustained in the future and to become sustainable, this uh, unjust flows of resources from the rest of the world have to be addressed. 
And this is how we see the growth. So we see the growth as a, as a critique in the belly of the beast of, in the belly of the beast meaning Europe and North America, which is uh, where we are writing from, the four authors, uh, of an idea that it is Western and an idea that has been part and parcel of capitalism and colonialism. And uh, an idea that, um, that has been exported uh, to the rest of the world and has been hegemonic to the extent that it has um, sidelined all other alternatives uh, way of being, of organizing the economy, of organizing society that might emerge uh, autochthonously from in other places of the world. So our idea in the book, and we emphasize that, we call for the growth in Europe and uh, North America. Uh, which means we call for an abolishment uh, of the um, pursuit and uh, standard of uh, judging our societies by the standard of cost and uh, increase of production and consumption. So we call for an abolishing this in our part of the world. And we also call for a radical reduction of resource and energy use, unlike anything seen in the past. Uh, both by, of course, technological improvements, but also by behavior and lifestyle changes, and fundamentally by economic restructuring and a general economic uh, slowdown, what we call as the growth. We call for this uh, in our part of the world, in Europe uh, and, and uh, in North America, because that's the part we know, that's the part we study, that's the part we live in, and that's the part we can talk about. We don't talk, we don't call for the growth in the rest of the world, but that doesn't mean uh, that the growth is not relevant for the rest of the world. The growth, not in the sense of reducing production and consumption, but for example, the growth as uh, Arturo Escobar, uh, famous anthropologist said when we launched the book in the University of Florida on Monday, he said like in Latin America and in Colombia that he studies and he is from, uh, there is a need for the growth in extractivism. So, he said the, the growth of what he considers to be the occupational forces, he called them, of the territory of Colombia, which are there just to, to extract resources at as low cost as possible. And they don't let people on the territory develop their own um, modes of livelihood and their own ideas of uh, buen vivir, of the good life. Um, so in that sense, yes, it's something we argue and we call for, for our part of the world. We emphasize also the the responsibility in global terms of Europe to make ecological space uh, for the rest of the world. So unless, unless our energy consumption and production and emissions uh, decline radically, drastically here, we, there is no feasible or visible scenario um, of avoiding climate change and of not uh, shifting the costs of climate change to those most vulnerable, which are outside the borders of our country. That doesn't mean that we won't suffer here too, but others will suffer much more. So we are arguing that the only scenario compatible with a global climate and social justice is one where Europe and North America seriously degrow. I explained what we, what we mean by degrowth. I have like seven minutes more to, to share a few thoughts. Just to say that um, because I think it would be much nicer if, if you ask me the questions and we do it like that. And also, you can ask me also about the questions if you've read them from the book. But uh, these questions that I have in the book have been developed over the years by debates like the one we have now, where many questions come and to which we have uh, developed a set of responses. Um, now, what, what we try to do a little bit in this book, which is a little bit braver than previous attempts or the attempts of others who write about the growth, is like, I mean, the standard critique will be like, yes, that, that sounds nice what you're saying, but it's politically impossible and socially impossible, you know, like uh, go tell this to the people who want to buy things in Christmas. I mean, these people are us, no, it's not someone else uh, who want to fly, who want to do this. Uh, uh, go tell that to governments, go tell that to the 40% of Americans who vote Trump, but also to, <laughs> I would say, also to the 40% who vote Biden. There is a big di difference there in terms of their view of how important growth is. Um, so yes, it's politically very dif difficult. I like a, a phrase that William Ray wrote and that, that he said, uh, the ecologically necessary might be politically impossible, but uh, the politically acceptable is ecologically 
ecologically impossible or irrelevant. He said something along these lines, which I think sums it up well. And uh, the first response to this critique would be, even if it's politically impossible, that doesn't change the fact that it's true, that it's necessary. I mean, we might argue whether it's possible or not, but this the fact that the, what we advocate as the growth might not might be politically very difficult doesn't mean that green growth or some other techno fantasy is, uh, is any more true for that reason. Um, but we take seriously the fact that we have to create uh, plausible scenarios of transition to something akin to degrowth. Otherwise, it just stays at the level of critique, no? of critiquing growth, which has been the case since the Limits to Growth report uh, 50 years ago, but doesn't go further than critique. So we take very seriously the effort to, to flesh out an alternative. And uh, the alternative we flesh out uh, consists of first of all looking at the grassroots that want something akin to the growth not in the name of the growth but who live every day and practice something the growth and that's where we emphasize uh, the economies of the commons or what uh, feminist economists uh, gibson graham call community economies all these economies that they are not the standard market for profit economy activities but that they are all around us and they are cooperative efforts um, that do things differently, that put the emphasis on use value rather than profit and exchange and exchange value. So that's one thing, that's the grassroots. Then we have policies and we, we address at least five policies that we think would be uh, core leverages if we were to move in a big growth direction. And the first one is like a Green New Deal, uh, but that wouldn't be funded in an expansionary way. So a Green New Deal is like a big reinvestment program into energy, transport and agriculture to green these sectors. And the second proposal we have is a universal care income, which is a universal basic income, but with an emphasis on uh, compensating the uncompensated and undervalued work of care and caretaking. Together with universal basic services, we have this as the second proposal. The third one is a reduction of the working week. The fourth one is a support of uh, economy of the commons and solidarity economies actively with legislation and and public financing. And the fifth one is an overhaul of the taxation system to tax um, carbon and resources instead of uh, work and labor, and also wealth and uh, maximum income taxes. I'm saying these things a little bit fast, but these are the this is the, poli the policy package of five policies we have. Then we have the economy of the commons, which is the grassroots that it's organizing to live differently. And then we create a plausible scenario of how could this unfold. And we argue that the more these local economies of commons or regional economies of commons expand and more and more we and other people put more of our time in these economies as opposed to the conventional market economies, the more a different uh, sphere of community economies would expand against that of uh, market economies, a less commodified economy of commons. Now, we know that uh, capitalism and the market economy will not take that easily. So if this happens, they will try to subdue and either commodify or legislate out of existence this competing economy. So there we argue that it's really important that if a conscience of those who participate in this economy is, uh, grows by participating in these economies and by living differently and by wanting to defend their commons, then the next step and the necessary step is a political movement to expand that. And the political movement and the political conflict is uh, inevitable there. And this political conflict and political movement um, will decide whether a different future transformation is possible or is not possible. It's not something that can be predicted. Now, this political movement, of course, needs also policies and institutional changes and political demands to put in place if, in state, if it takes state power to facilitate the opening of space for alternative economies uh, beyond growth. And this is where the five policies come into play. So if, if there is to be a political movement for the commons and takes power, what could it do differently than it's done right now? This sounds quite speculative, but it's not so speculative. It's based on our experience here in Barcelona, where indeed uh, there was a very vibrant community economy and cooperative economies, uh, cooperative economy in the city has been here uh, ever since the fall of the dictatorship, and it dates back to the anarchist period in Barcelona. So there is a long historical tradition of cooperative economy. Um, with the occupation of the squares in the Occupy Squares or Indignado movement, as it was called here, this, uh, this economy and this society evolved into a political movement. A political party was founded in the squares, after the squares was founded. A lot of the people participating in the commons economies became part of this movement. 
And this movement won the elections in 2015 and has been governing the city since then. It's not perfect, it's not a perfect government. I'm not going to idealize it or romanticize it, but it is one plausible path. And this government since then has done a lot, as we explain in the book, to open up and defend the commons and try to create uh, economic alternatives beyond uh, the one-way future that was portrayed before of Barcelona, uh, competing to attract uh, foreign capital to become like the brand name of, I don't know what, the digital hub of uh, Europe and tourist hub of Europe, etc. So it has tried to charter an alternative and it has done also a lot of interesting uh, things inside the city from slowing down traffic in the city to, to trying to revitalize the neighborhoods to uh, developing a bike sharing infrastructure um, and many other things. So this micro example serves to us as a model to think of how a political transition to what we are advocating in this book could become plausible. Okay, so I stop here and I'm happy to answer your questions. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Georges. Um, just to get the ball rolling, I already see a question in the chat, but I did want to ask you to reflect on uh, one of your most recent articles. It's uh, with Jason Hickel, and its uh, title is Green Growth Possible in a journal mm -hmm. called New Political Economy. And it's been uh, sort of remarkably well cited uh, just within the past uh, month, uh, year or so. Is yeah. What is your impression of the conversation and how it's developing in terms of how uh, other scholars have engaged? I think it's a little bit stuck, this conversation, but like many, many conversations, which I think are politically sensitive, are stuck and then you have two camps and each one is, is uh, refining its argument and its data. But um, I mean, the, the the argument we make in the paper is that the UN, the World Bank, everyone is talking about green growth. So we're saying, okay, is this happening or is it possible or is it just wishful thinking and wishful talking? And we look at two things. We look at the resources and we look at, um, at carbon emissions. Now, there is a difference between resources and carbon emissions. Carbon emissions are a particular resource, are, are, the, are the side effect of fossil fuels. So no one can, let's say, argue from from fundamentals that there is no reason why you can't substitute uh, one source of energy for another, fossil fuels uh, for another source of energy. Or there are, of course, a lot of path dependencies and lock-ins and vested interests that make it difficult. But theoretically, it's not impossible to think that we can decouple uh, GDP from fossil fuel use. And I mean, we have to decouple it one way or the other, if, in, even if we go for the growth. There's no way that we can continue at the same level of, of uh, use of fossil fuels and technologies using fossil fuels. Uh, but for resources in general, it's a different question because then it becomes a little bit more theoretical. Can the economy really grow without using more and more resources? And resources there meaning whatever type of resources. So if you stop using fossil fuels, then you start using uh, um, lithium and cobalt for renewables. So you, you switch, but overall resources um, might stay the same or increase. Um, so there are two questions. And in both questions, we say that those who call for green growth, uh, the empirical record disproves their case. And in terms of uh, resources, I mean, in terms of resources, it's pretty clear. If you look at the global resource use and the global GDP, they move almost hand in hand. I mean, GDP grew a little bit faster from 70s, from mid 70s to mid 90s, to end of 90s, a little bit faster. I mean, just just a little bit faster, but they grew almost together. And since then, since the mid 2000s, uh, actually resource use is growing faster than GDP. But more or less, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Then if you do it on a cross-sectional country by country analysis, uh, you find a relation of 0 0.8. So 1% growth in GDP, 0.8% growth in resource use. They are very coupled. And then we look even at the published scientific models and we see that None of them predicts by 2050 a reduction in resource use. Uh, the best case scenario is that an increase that it's lower than GDP and it's like 20 or 30 percent. So we're saying there there is no sign of green growth and no one is actually talking about green growth in the scientific literature apart from the policy documents of World Bank, etc. And if we go to carbon emissions, uh, Yes, uh, GDP has grown faster than carbon emissions. There is some relative decoupling, as it's called, not absolute decoupling yet at the at, at the global level, like emissions haven't started decreasing that it's in absolute uh, terms. 
Uh, also, again, at the cross-sectional level, you find the relationship that it's from 0.6 to 1, like 1% 1 growth in GDP corresponds to 0.6 to 1% 1 growth in carbon emissions. Um, and again, what we say there, if we look at future scenarios, if we take the IPCC scenarios of 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, all, of them all of them predict growth apart from one. All of these scenarios predict growth. And then, of course, they cannot square emissions. Um, they cannot square emissions to stay within 1.5 degrees with a level of uh, decarbonization and renewable energy infrastructure foreseen. So the way to square it now is uh, you might be familiar with that is to talk about negative emission technologies and how much carbon we can absorb from the atmosphere and then turn it into pellets. I mean, okay, it's good to look for technologies uh, because we're probably we're going to fail. So one way or the other, we have to absorb carbon. But the other fact is that to just square scenarios by assuming unrealistic and untested levels of uh, carbon absorption, we are saying that's, I mean, that's that's irresponsible and it's not... It's not, it's really a fantasy. So again, we don't have a green growth there. So growth is catastrophic and we just try to square it off by imagining some green in the future that hasn't been tested. The only scenario that they, and now, yesterday, these days there was another scenario produced in the same lines. The only scenarios that can stay within 1.5 degrees uh, with decarbonization and renewable energy are also scenarios that uh, allow for a radical reduction of energy use and the slowing down of the economy. So we argue that that's not green growth, that's green degrowth, and <laughs> that's that's where support. Now, have we convinced the other side? No, we haven't, you know, and I'm afraid the, I, I, I can go further and say what are the counter arguments of the other side, but I'm afraid there it's, it's, uh, it's hard to convince one another, unfortunately. Thank you. Now we have a couple of questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask directly, the easiest is that you unmute, switch on your video if you like. So first Kevin, then Max, and then Matthew. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Callas. Um, uh, I enjoyed your reference to uh, um, to uh, Ivan Ilyich's book, uh, Tools for Conviviality. Um, his work on de-schooling uh, addresses the need to abolish the current school system. Um, and how do you think we can achieve his aim to de-school society? and you know end the current uh, moribund uh, school system yeah i mean that's not something i've been uh, uh, i mean i have to stay within my limits now and that's that's not that's not a book of limits that i have read and um, it's not something that i have thought carefully um the type of arguments we make um uh, the type of arguments we make uh, in the book are um, in favor of cooperative and care and care economy. So cooperative systems of uh, of schooling and cooperative systems of uh, mutual care, of child care and of um, and of elder care. So I would emphasize that, but I would say that I haven't thought along the lines of uh, this schooling and um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the argument of Felix. I have to say that uh, many in the degrowth movement are, are in this direction of Felix, but I wouldn't say everyone. Um, yeah, I guess the reason I asked this question is because I think, you know, the, 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 the basis of our capitalist society is it's, it starts at, at school, in schools and this is training, if you like, the the, the, the future uh, growth agents of the, the capitalist society. So unless we address the issue of schooling where it all starts, uh, I think it's going to be difficult to get this uh, argument about degrowth uh, you know, to the new uh, generation. No, I agree, I agree. But I'm saying that I, I don't have something very ad more advanced than what you're saying to add. I think what, you, what you're saying sounds, sounds right to me, but it's not something that I have thought um, I have thought in more detail no because what you say yes it's it's common sense and makes sense eh? but I haven't thought about what what would be a reforms of the schooling system and of the education system in line with what we talk about in the book or we talk about in the growth generally we're talking we emphasize the importance of unlearning growth and we are saying we are saying in the book that the uh, growth is uh, is not just about uh, GDP it's not about the wealthy one percent. We make a joke in the book, and we say, even if we were the, they were to fly to Mars with 
Elon Musk and stay there. Um, the hegemony of growth would not end in one day or the other because it's something we are all uh, we've all learned and we're all trained in. You know, from scientists that we want to publish it here more and more and see our impact factor raise. You know, all these graphs we see on Google Scholar. They are all growth curves. You know, like growth curves dominates. Uh, our everyday activity of everyone. And we're saying we need to unlearn that. And you're right to say that, yes, if we need to unlearn that, we have to start thinking about how to unlearn that in the school system. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank so you. Max uh, Kaiser asked me to put his question forward on his behalf, and it's about the limits of the circular economy. He says, hello, Dr. Kallis, could you remind us what the basics of thermodynamics and entropy are and how it relates to degrowth? You saw that in the uh, in the in the questions I have a port a poll a, um, a question there about the circular economy, which I think is a good idea. Like recycling, reusing, reducing is uh, was, was one of the mottos of the growth when Serge Latus first wrote about it. So there's nothing to disagree there. It's just. The idea that we can have an economy that keeps expanding and it becomes more and more circular that it's it's problematic because. If we think the current industrial economy that it's uh, so productive and so wasteful at the same time, um, basic broke circularity, which was the characteristic of the economy before, and made it into a huge linearity, you know, that you extract resources, you use them as fast as possible, and then you extract them out of sight uh, also as fast as possible and as far as possible, you know. That's the model right now. It is extremely effective and efficient in producing uh, wealth where it is controlled uh, but at the cost of course of uh, shifting costs both to the extraction sites and to the to the disposal sites um, entropy i mean how to explain it in a simple way and not be caught uh, <laughs> red-handed by a physicist because there might always be one and say like your your explanation is vulgarly simple you know but to, 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 my, to my students or the examples I use sometimes, it's like, you know, that the, the law of entropy is that everything in, on Earth and universe is, there is a tendency from order to disorder, like from uh, ordered forms of, of energy to, to move towards disordered. And then if you want to put them back into order, you have to spend much more energy than the energy that was, uh, that was released in the tra transition from order to disorder. Um, uh, I mean, we can think very, very, very easy how easy it is to <laughs> to have disorder in our house without doing anything. Somehow the house becomes a mess, no? But then how much work it takes to bring it to bring it back to order? Or if you or if we want to be more serious, um, we can think uh, of uh, water from heat. You need to you produce you produce you, you you have to put energy to to heat, to to heat the water, but then the water just just gets cold on its own, you know. Um, um, there is a tendency, but this is debated among physicists. It's much more complicated than I, than I put it, or at least George Kurogin put it that there is a tendency for entropy to increase. And he described the economic process as an entropic process. That it's a process that takes um, dense, uh, high ordered forms of energy or materials, uh, uses them to produce useful services, and then produces low ordered. Uh, materials and energy. So the economic process, he argued, accelerates, speeds up uh, this entropy. So if you think fossil fuel took millions of years, billions of millions of years for them to, to be stored below the earth to become um, a dense form of energy, uh, economic process, we are taking them, we're just using them now, and then we release them into a completely disordered form, which is carbon dioxide. Um, so that's the, the entropic process. And you're just going to argue that the economy is an entropic process. And um, we have to realize that the current moment is a very specific moment where we tapped into a, a, an amazing source of low entropy resources that they are fossil fuels, but this is going to end. So I think Matthew's question uh, follows very nicely from this. Matthew, would you like to... Uh bring it up sure thanks uh Siddharf. so um what struck me about the about the, the talk and i is that, that there's the sort of theory part and then there's the policy agenda part which you laid out 
But when when it comes to that policy agenda, what strikes me is how actually how, how similar it is in some respects to what you hear from proponents of green growth. So people like Carlotta Perez, if you look at what she's proposing, a lot of the same ideas are there, universal basic income, green, uh, green New Deal, carbon taxes. Carlotta is very interested in the social economy, done a lot of work on it with Robin Murray. Um, so there's the question, you know, like, is there such a big difference between the degrowth uh, perspective and the green growth perspective? Kind of limited, link, linked to that, when you laid out that policy agenda, what it also immediately made me think of was Denmark because Denmark has a lot of those characteristics. It has, it's put a huge amount of investment into energy efficiency deep and low carbon technologies um, over the last 40 years. It's got very high carbon and energy taxes and has done for the last 35, 40 years. It's got a very strong welfare state, not quite a universal basic income maybe, but very strong and a very strong emphasis on um, the care of young children, very good arrangements for uh, in leave, parental leave and, and so on. Um, and, but it's also, as we know, it's a capitalist society which, you know, which has economic growth. And that, what make, that makes me think is actually, ha, you know, the question, so my question to you is, actually, isn't this, you know, isn't this largely addressing the, the, the sort of symptom rather than the underlying cause? I mean, the underlying cause of economic growth is capitalism. Um, and, uh, so shouldn't we be, I'm quite surprised that the, the degrowth school doesn't then call for much more a much more radical agenda of change, looking at things like ownership, modes of production, really uh, kind of pervasive changes in taxes and um, the, the basic economic relationships that we have um, in the system that, that, that actually produce growth in an underlying way. So a little bit of a kind of uh, call for, for more radicalism. What do you think? No, I agree. I mean, I fully agree with what you're saying. So yes, uh, Carlota Perez actually is one of the people that I think it's, um, I mean, we disagree on the, that she emphasizes green growth, like Matsukato also emphasizes green growth, but there are many other aspects in their work that I really like um, in terms of understanding the role of the state, in terms of understanding the role of the state in, uh, in infrastructure, in tech, technological innovation. Uh, so it's not the person, let's say, there, there are people who defend green growth with much more opposing agendas to the one we have. Um, but in the book, we make, we make this argument. We know that, we, let's say, preemptively, we start the very chapter with this critique, and we're saying what we're going to describe here is proposed by other progressive people, and it's prog proposed also by the Green parties for quite some time now. So um, some of our proposals. But we're saying it makes a, a very big difference whether you see these proposals as part of a radical agenda of uh, moving in a degrowth and commons uh, direction, or if you see my, them as palliatives to the current system that with a little bit of that, um, uh, the current system can continue growing or can keep going as it goes. And, and your example of Denmark is fine, yes, because Denmark does certain of these things, but does them still within a logic of expansion and capitalism and growth. And at the end, not even the carbon emissions of Denmark, not to talk about uh, GDP, but the carbon emissions of Denmark are, are not sustainable and are not uh, uh, generalizable at the global level. So Denmark has done better than others in terms of reducing carbon emissions, but its level is still at the level that if, if all the rest of the world, which is the only way I can think about carbon emissions now, if, if the rest of the world was emitting what Denmark emits, it's uh, still super high. So obviously, yes, the model of Denmark, which I would call it a progressive model of green growth, uh, is not enough. Um, we have to go. We have to go further than, than that. And capitalism is the problem, and, and we recognize that in the book. But like, you know, sometimes sometimes I have a problem. Is like we go from capitalism is the problem to how do we think the transition uh, beyond or out cap outside of capitalism? You know, and then um, the things you mentioned, I think. Uh, you, you mentioned the change of uh, the ownership of, of means of production, of, of definitely certain means of production. So I think a lot of the proposals we have, for example, for universal basic services, for communalizing and turning into commons the basics of water, energy, housing, these are proposals we have inside. They are proposals that exactly are taking uh, space out of capitalism and turning private property into commons, into public property. A basic income 
depending on how it's envisaged and how it's implemented, can also be um, a proposal that goes completely against uh, the logic of capitalism. Depends, though, because you can have a basic income. Financial Times are also talking about basic income and, and, and Elon Musk and uh, Zuckerberg, no? So, but the basic income, we argue, in a, in a different mindset, in, in, in the idea that we're going to take a share out of capital and we're going to give it to caretakers for taking care of themselves and everyone will be able to survive and have a decent mode of living without having to sell uh, her labor for wage um, somewhere she doesn't want or he doesn't want. Again, we think that's that's a huge uh, that's a huge uh, change to the capitalist system. And that's of course why it doesn't happen. We haven't seen any country, Denmark including, to implement a serious um, a serious effort of uh, of uh, basic income. So in in one sense they are reformist and they seem uh, easy. But like if we were to do if we were to really push for these proposals radically, I think they're quite revolutionary. And I use their, I, I used to two to intellectuals there who have made a similar, but not exactly the same argument. Uh, Andre Gortz, who called them uh, uh, revolutionary reforms, non-reformist reforms, he called them actually, you know, which I think is a, is a, is a little bit captures the thing. Like a basic income looks like a reform, but if you do it, the whole system, has completely to change to, to accommodate a serious basic income. And Slavo Zizek, who also uh, wrote at some point, you know, like these reforms seem like super banal and reforms, but he says that's precisely why you should be demanding them because they make common sense, they are obvious. People say, yes, that makes sense, a basic income for everyone, working less since we have more productivity. But the capitalist system cannot really take them because they completely go against the logic of the kind of the capitalist system. Capitalist system cannot uh, cannot tolerate that people will work four or three days per week because productivity has increased. Cannot tolerate that people will have a basic income and can decide that, you know what, I don't want to work for minimum wage job that you are offering me in uh, for a pittance. So there they are reforms in one sense, but I think they're much more radical than it seems when I kind of say them like one after the other in, in within three minutes, you know. Other questions for Georges? Just to keep the ball rolling while people are thinking, um, one of the things I really like um, that you bring up in the book and also in the FAQs chapter is, uh, is that cheapness in a way drives consumption, that uh, it's not that as soon as things get um, lower resource intensive that then we consume less in fact we consume more of it and faster and um and sort of a, a, i feel like there's a tension there between a, a green growth argument that would then look at particular examples of success and then a degrowth view where you seem to be leaning back and taking a systemic perspective and saying look the problem here is that the political economy doesn't allow you to have that decoupling where you have greater resource productivity and therefore end up consuming less. The real world drivers, um, the capitalist logic, if you like, as you've been discussing uh, with regard to Matthew's question. So is it, why is it that that's a, such a difficult argument to get a sort of popular appetite for? It's not to say that degrowth isn't a popular concept, but it seems to be that there's this stuck back and forth. Is it possible to communicate that systemic perspective in a way that can really take on the uh, the sort of powerful imagery of particular examples that seem to also capture the public imagination. I mean, there, there are two things there. I mean, the first thing, the first thing you said, I agree. And I, I, I sometimes when I want to provoke economists to say that the coupling is possible, I use the example of within capitalism, let's say, I use the example of uh, labor productivity. So if you talk about labor productivity, an economist could always say, uh, no, it's not gonna lead to unemployment. No, it's not gonna lead to less people uh, working or less people used. Why? Because they tell you, oh, if we improve labor productivity, then uh, you know we're gonna have growth and with growth, we're gonna employ more people. Uh, but then when they shift to the resource uh, example, then somehow, their resource productivity or resource efficiency is supposed to lead to less resource use. But I would argue that precisely on the same pattern that less labor productivity doesn't lead uh, necessarily to less, to less employment precisely because there is growth which then 
uh, will employ more people and will need to have a cheap labor to, to employ, just makes labor cheaper, let's say, and then it can be employed uh, in other activities. The same thing uh, happens uh, with resources. Um, you have resource productivity, which leads to more resource use. That's, that's a particular way capitalist system works now, because uh, it needs cheap resources and, and cheap uh, labor uh, in order to keep expanding. This doesn't mean that theoretically you couldn't have a, um, a situation where you limit how much, how, for example, how many hours people work uh, and therefore how much labor you can use now. And then the, the labor productivity that you have just releases uh, people from work and people work less and less. Or on the same token, you can say we're going to list less and less resources and more and more resource productivity means less and less resources. But for that, you need to put a limit and and this is where it doesn't resonate theoretically. Like theoretically, many advocates of green growth would tell you, yeah, there's no problem for capitalism to do that. We are arguing instead that, you know, it's capitalism needs cheap labor and cheap resources. It's never gonna put this limit and try to, to grow with uh, the rest that remains to grow, you know, just science and technology, etc. cetera. Uh, but then the argument becomes a little bit, um, difficult to, re to resolve uh, rationally or empirically, because we would argue this hasn't happened in the past. And someone will tell you like, okay, this hasn't happened in the past, can happen in the future though, you know? So there, there, there I think is where the debate about green growth versus the growth gets stumbled. Now uh, for the population at large, I don't think that's a problem. That's not where the, where the growth uh, hits a wall. Uh, I, I think where, it, where, it, where it's difficult is because people live in, we all live in capitalist economies, that they either grow or collapse and uh, we know what it means not to have growth so then to, to talk about not having growth uh, is really difficult and i would say it's also difficult for anti-capitalists and those who are critical of capitalism to accept that uh, growth is not uh, desirable because they will tell you growth under capitalism is the problem but growth under a different system that wouldn't be necessarily growth of what we count now as GDP and would be growth of nice things uh, uh, is not a problem and like a different system would develop what we need etc which I don't think is a wrong argument per se but I think it's still captured in this mindset of uh, growth which I think it's much more problematic than often acknowledged. More questions coming in first from Marius and then from Katie. Please uh, go ahead and ask uh, Georges yourself. Hi, yeah, I can't get my camera on here, but uh, oh yeah, there it is. No, uh, yeah, thank you for the very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I just have a, been working a little bit with the concept of sufficiency myself. And um, I think that's quite interesting because it goes into the little bit more the nitty gritty of how you can understand the types of services that are needed and um, what type of needs do they cover and how are needs of course also socially constructed and um and they, it's kind of based on the idea that there are limits of course and um also this um, donuts economics model of katie raw worth uh, i think is also quite interesting with recognizing the the idea of limits into the understanding of economics so i was just wondering how does that I haven't read the book, unfortunately, so I just think uh, I've, I've ordered it, so I'm going to read it. But I was just wondering how it fits in with the, with the degrowth um, idea. Thank you. No, absolutely. It's the same family of ideas, and they're very much, uh, they're very much related. So sufficiency is the way to go about thinking about that, and moving from an emphasis on efficiency or productivity and moving on an emphasis on, on sufficiency. Research-wise, there is great work done right now. Julia Steinberger and her group are producing amazing work on trying to quantify uh, what would the sufficient energy-wise system of living would look like. And they calculate that we could have uh, 10 billion people uh, living decent lives with half of the energy use that is needed right now. So I think also research-wise is fantastic. And Kate's, Kate's work in communicating a different set of economics where we think of um, social minima, absolute social necessities, basic needs that have to be met within planetary boundaries. I think it's uh, it's a good way of going to think, uh, of going on thinking about it. Dan O'Neill also and Julia Steinberger, they a nice work on trying to quantify what good that might mean, uh, living within planetary boundaries, how social needs can be satisfied. 
So I really like all this work. I, I think what we add from a degrowth perspective is, um, it's a, it's a, I think Matthew was who asked me. I, I don't, uh, yeah, we we tend to be a little bit more into which maybe didn't come out very strong now the way I presented the book. No, but we tend to be a little bit more aware that it's not just a matter of conceptualizing these things and saying. Uh, we have to live within the limits, but that there is a system, a capitalist system, that it's bound to grow without limits or else collapse, you know. So we think it's much more important, much more important, no, it's equally important to understand how the capitalist system works and how we can have plausible transition pathways within it and what kind of conflict and political alliances and struggles that would uh, involve. So I think it's a, it, it's, it's a parallel task, but equally important. I think Katie's question follows very naturally here. Katie. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, lovely. Hi, well, thank you for um, for this. It's really, I'm really glad that this has been organised. It's really interesting. Um, I'm currently uh, reading the book, currently learning about degrowth. So it's something I've kind of, kind of come across in the last few months um, and being quite interested in it, quite passionate about it, really wanted to communicate it to others. My degree is kind of a, a split between the environment and communication. So my passion is really sort of to communicate these ideas to to other people that may may not have come across them, may not even be interested particularly. Um, and I think with with degrowth, the difficult thing, particularly in in some sort of circles, for example, in sales, production, and, and things like that, it's it goes completely against the grain. You know, the whole principle is based on continuous growth, beating last year's targets, just constantly just going up, up, up. Um, so I just wondered what you know how we can more effectively uh, communicate this this idea. Yeah, I mean that's 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 a problem. I mean, yes, they, 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 these are difficult questions. I mean, I, I've been thinking about it too. You know that if you, because it's a world that I don't interact so much. But if I interact through a friend or someone I know, or by watching a documentary or whatever about the marketing world or the actual corporate world or how food chains are operating, I mean, there's a huge huge part of the population that it's daily living depends on this uh, constant growth of the activity that they are involved in and i would say in the book we say it's not only it's not only the people involved in this type of super capitalistic competitive economic activity but also it permeates to the rest of us and i insist on us academics you know like um, more and more our logic is one of quantified uh, growth year after year although it's completely stupid for us it's like completely performative you know it's almost as if it's to brainwash us because it's not really that anyone also benefits from us publishing 10 papers instead of 15 or getting thousand citations instead of 500 you know like you can get like 10 citations and have written something very important and like a few people i mean I assume going, I don't go into the details, but we're not even pro producing commercial profit, but it's like so pervasive this idea um, that it's, it's difficult to say. But I mean, I call it idea, but it's not idea, it's material. So it has to change materially and it has to change politically and economically. So I, I, my thing is not to go and lecture someone who works in marketing, a friend and tell her or him Oh, you shouldn't sell more next year and be fired, you know, because they will be fired. So then I'm not offering there, or I'm not going to tell them they're stupid and they think about growth and they shouldn't, no. Uh, the level at which I intervene, at least academically, is to think of oh, what structural changes at the level of the economy and at the level of polity we could fight as citizens for, and that would allow different forms of economies to emerge and people find a meaningful living there rather than have to work as salesmen that have to sell more and more every year. Thank you. Great. I think there's been a bit of uh, uh, input on the side. Um, Max asked if you could say something about the four day week in France and uh, Matthew perhaps wants to chip in again on how that might be capital uh, compatible with capitalism. The four-day work week in France didn't really happen. I mean, what it happened. Uh, I mean, uh, there is a long story there, but from what I understand, it's like uh, it was implemented, and then Sarkozy was elected, and he basically took all the teeth out of it, and at the end, 
it wasn't really implemented. And, the, and I mean, the question was how would it be implemented in sectors that were not directly in just the public sector or you can implement it a little bit easier, let people live halfway uh, on Friday, but how do you implement it on the public sector? How do you implement it on, on, um, on service workers, you know, especially low paid service workers? So in that sense, uh, unless you tell me that you went to France and Friday looked like a Sunday, I won't believe that there is a four day work week in, in France. So there isn't, and there is, but there's been a lot of work by economists trying to prove that it didn't do anything, you know, uh, which just doesn't make sense that it didn't do anything, you know, that it didn't, uh, it, it didn't improve uh, the living of people. I mean, first of all, it didn't, it didn't really happen. And to the other extent, we know that from six days to five days, they have been uh, substantial improvements in terms of uh, the quality of life of people um, and even the, the impacts on the economy were not uh, terrible as 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 people say that if uh, there is a four work week the economy is going to collapse so i think there is a lot of ideological working uh, work going on there trying to, to dismiss the idea of a four day work week but i don't think france has a four day work week to be honest Thanks. Are there any other questions? We have a few minutes. Yeah, Matthew, you want to say just something? The, just on this, on the four-day work week thing, I guess the, the, the way I think about it is, look, you know, there's, there's no, in the 19th century, in the mills in the UK, uh, the, work, the working week was 70 hours a week, you know, and now it's 35 and a half or whatever it is, or, you know, it's different in different countries. And the point about France is that, okay, the four-day week, no, but work, we know that the working working hours in France are much lower than they are in other capitalist countries like the US, for example, much, much lower. Mm -hmm. And you can see the difference, actually, if you go to France versus going to the US on a Sunday. Um, yeah. But, you know, productivity per week is, per, sorry, per hour is higher in France and productivity in the US, if once you take that into account, it's about the same in, in the US and France. But I guess the point is that they're both, you know, they're both capitalist countries and they're both growing and they both have growing economies. So you can cut, you know, you can have a different working number of working hours or a different shorter working week and so on. Um, and generally, you know, working weeks in, in Europe will be shorter than the US or pro and probably shorter than in, in kind of uh, economies in Asia as well. But, the, you know, I guess, I guess it goes back to my, my question about uh, that doesn't necessarily sort of get to grips with the underlying issue about growing economies yeah that's just an observation no no I, I agree i agree with this just to say that the, the logic we go is a little bit different than perhaps i presented so the idea is not like okay we want the growth how do we go there we go by reducing the working week we, we reduce by reducing the working hours you know the logic goes the other way like um, we have economies that that have to contract use less and less resources and uh, how can this become um, socially sustainable? And we're saying like, there's gonna be less work, paid work to go around. But one way of going about is like reducing working uh, hours so that uh, everyone can share the available work. So that's, let, let's say the argument is a little bit, is a little bit moves the other, the other direction. But, but I agree with what you're saying, yes. Just by changing the working, the working, uh, the working hours will not make a capitalist economy suddenly a degrowth economy. But I think by adding all the five changes that we have uh, in in the radical variant, and perhaps a few more that we don't have there, but it's like how we produce money, how we circulate money, etc. Which and especially which uh, which services and what part of the economy is, uh, becomes a commons and with what remains a private property. I think in an uh, ideal scenario that all these changes took place, then I would think that France would look very different, wouldn't look like a capitalist country. But that's, that's the ideal scenario that all these changes take place uh, together. Because the other thing is like, yes, we, 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 we criticize capitalism, but then again, yes, we say the means of production, yes, the means, the way finance works, yes. Uh, the way everything becomes commodified and it's part of markets, yes. But then when we have to specify the alternative, um, it has to be sketched somehow. So that's 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 an effort uh, to sketch the alternatives, starting from what already exists, and not imagine suddenly, you know, an overthrow of the palace, and then like starting from zero and organizing everything completely different. You know, even if it was to be organized completely different, how would it be organized? 
differently. That's that's a little bit where the direction we are going with this kind of, with these institutional changes. I see we're on the R. I'll allow one last question from Fulke, who um, who might want to ask it himself. I can read it out. Um, Volker says, we have a lot of metrics for carbon emissions, but not so much about resource use. How do you look at the ecological footprint concept? I can perhaps add that uh, he's involved as a citizen in Sweden in organizing an event next year, uh, drawing um, uh, on your body of work as well. Thank you. Um... No, there are there are pretty good indicators for material flows. There is a whole UN database. There is the work of the group of uh, marine officer Kowalski and many other people now uh, in Austria doing amazing work on quantifying uh, material flows. And I mean the latest uh, the latest research there is to quantify material footprints, which is uh, how much materials are embedded also in the imports that they are coming. Uh, uh, that we are using, we are consuming in our economies, but they are produced somewhere else. And there are quite good methods developed there. So material footprint, I really like it as a method. Uh, one critique there is like, okay, how do you aggregate all these different things? You know, so when you, when I say resource use grows hand in hand with GDP, I do a big aggregation, which is to aggregate tons of fossil fuels with ton of cement, with tons of gold. Obviously there is a problem when we do that. But I think of how we aggregate things in the economy. You know, we aggregate them according to their price, so it's not much less problematic. Uh, and the, the thing is also, if you separate these materials per category, you see, you see a similar pattern. So the aggregate is not that different in terms of its trend from its constituents. Uh, so I think we do have good. Now, the ecological footprint, I don't like it so much, to be honest, because uh, I don't like it because it tries to turn everything into land. It tries to take things that are not land related into land. And I think then it becomes too speculative, too speculative and too, it can be manipulated in, in many ways. So I think scientifically there, there have been some critiques that I've read of the ecological footprint method that have con convinced me that it, it simply not a good method i mean the material flows also aggregating them as i said is problematic but at least you know you're measuring tons of materials and that's what you're talking about the ecological footprint of talking about carbon emissions changing them into the land equivalent of the forest you need to plant in order to absorb these carbon emissions uh, starts becoming a little bit too much and uh, I have also some problems with the communicative idea, which I understand is powerful. This idea that we use uh, two or three Earths, I don't remember how many, it's here, or we already used Earth this year and it's still April, you know? Fine, but then, you know, it's April and then nothing happened and then we keep living until December. And it's like, so I, I wonder also how, how, how powerful this communicative idea is, is after a while. Or we use two or three Earths, fine, but we're still here and we live in one Earth. You know, like I, I have also a problem with this. Um, we are using too much, too much things. I don't think it's so powerful as it's, we, we environmentalists sometimes think it is. And I criticize actually this framing of the environmental question on my book, uh, limits why Malthus was wrong. That, that was my previous book and the one I'm very proud of because I, I tried to a little bit uh, call for environmentalists to break out of this mold of framing the earth as a limited planet that we are overusing and we are using too much of it because I think it's a problematic actually framing of the question. Sure, just thank you for your work, for how much you've contributed and for taking the time out today and to everybody for coming. But uh, it was great having you. We'll say thank you and goodbye for now. Thank you, Sidgart, for organizing it. Thank you very much.